started 11 years ago. The first batch was completely undrinkable. Drank it anyway. Uh, second batch was marginally less so. And batch number three was when it started to get good. There are key components that are going to be the same in every absinthe. There's an alcohol base, there's going to be wormwood, and there's going to be some anise characteristics. From there, it all branches out. It's the pinnacle of what the distiller's art form is. It's taking a number of super loud ingredients and making them all sing in harmony with one another. The best thing for us is to be able to put a glass of something in front of somebody and instead of them saying, oh, this is smooth, which is such a bullshit compliment for a spirit, but to have them say, wow, this reminds me of when I was a kid. This reminds me of a trip that I took to, to France years ago. Since we released the absinthe, the, the first day was the 21st of December. That day we had literally hundreds and hundreds of people lining up. I want it to be about the product, not about the hype. I would rather have a dozen or so really devoted people who love it because of the way it tastes, because of the way it makes them feel, than have them buying it because of any historical reasons or because they think it's going to make them hallucinate and chop an ear off. Of course, we take the grapes, yeah? We squeeze the grapes. We do, we squish a bunch of grapes. Typically, it's a wine like a Chardonnay that wine becomes a high proof brandy. We filled the still with a certain amount of that brandy. I won't tell you how much, it's an industry secret. And then certain amounts of star anise, wormwood, and fennel. It sits in the still overnight. We put water in the still and then we apply steam. That heat liberates the alcohol from that alcohol water mixture. It also heats all the essential oils in the different botanicals that are in the pot those essential oils and the alcohol and a certain amount of water all rise up as vapors. We're purifying as little as we possibly can because purification means you're stripping everything other than alcohol out. We want to keep all these, these botanical essential oils that we've fought so hard for. They rise up in the vapor and then down into another stainless steel column that's actually a condenser. It's a place where we take the heat away from that vapor Removing the heat condenses it back down to a liquid, then it flows out into our little spirits receiver. Once we've collected enough, that's when we'll do our secondary infusion with the herbs that provide the color and then more flavor and aroma. Each one of those ingredients was chosen for a reason. The lemon balm picks up on some of the citrus components that you get from the star anise. The meadow sweet and the stinging nettle pick up some of the grassy aromatics that come from the wormwood. The color is completely incidental to me. There are going to be color variations from batch to batch. If I had to blend for color, I'm going to lose aroma or flavor as a focus. To do 3,600 bottles, it takes us about 10 straight days of distillation. So we can do 360 bottles a day. No, it doesn't make you hallucinate. It, it makes you more aware or it allows you to be more aware when you're truly inebriated. Artists can see things that aren't there anyway. The main people that drank absinthe early on were artists, and so it enhanced what they were doing, and I think that's where the misconception comes from. It's a lovely sort of a sensation when you drink absinthe. Your tongue starts to go numb, your gums start to go numb. You do feel this, this warming sensation from the alcohol as well as a cooling sensation from all the anethols. There's a, a little bit more of a focus. The air seems a little sharper, images seem a little cleaner, so you're drunk and you remember more of it and you see more. It's not hallucination though. If you want to hallucinate, there are a lot of other really fabulous ways of doing that. A lit sugar cube is just absolutely asinine and insane. You're gonna take a product that's 120 proof that, um, that if you breathe too heavily on could, could potentially ignite and light a sugar cube on top of it. That's, that's silly. I think the sugar was really there because Early absinths were insanely bitter, and a lot of them just had bad flavors, and sugar is a great way to cover up a lot of flaws in a product. What I like to do is take something like this, this lovely absinthe fountain, fill that with, with ice and then water, and slowly drip cold water into the glass. You get this layer of louche that forms at the bottom of the glass. That is the opalescent layer, and it comes because you've got all these essential oils that are soluble at high alcohol contents, and they're much less so at lower alcohol contents. So as you're adding water, bringing that alcohol content down, the, these oils come out in the form of tiny, tiny, tiny droplets and they make it cloudy. You get different aromatic focus from each alcohol level and you get a different um, 
a different delivery on the palate at each level as well. So it gives you the opportunity of having an almost infinite number of different products in one glass. It's the sort of thing that you can really enjoy just sitting and sipping on an afternoon, as long as you don't have a whole lot to do the rest of the day. I, um, off camera. There's a, there's a part of me that hates any of them that are going to be built on the hype of something else. Mansynth. Hmm. That's probably not hype. It's probably not a whole bunch of marketing bullshit. It's probably just a sound, solid, amazing product. There are really only three key players in the game right now. Um, one of them, when they came out, took the Annis character down a few notches to try and appeal to the American market. And I think, I think it's a little unfair to the marketplace to do that to rob them of an authentic experience, especially if you're the first one out there. Well, you can probably figure out who I'm talking about based on all that. But then you get something like some of the ones that Le Cure de France has made, uh, some of the ones that Ted Bro has made that are just, they're poetry in a glass, and you want to drink the shit out of these things, and then you understand why somebody's making absinthe, because it tastes great. One, it's not illegal. If you pick up a Sunset magazine pretty much every summer, they'll recommend it for its finely cut leaf structure and powdery blue complexion. Provides a, a wonderful accent point for any garden. We found a great organic herb grower in Washington, and she planted the wormwood around her herb garden to keep the deer out. Wormwood is so amazingly bitter in its raw form that when the deer would show up and nibble on this stuff, they'd say, screw this man, I'm out of here. It is a beautiful plant. We've got some growing right out in the front of the distillery. Don't tell anybody, but we're working on an absinthe blanche. It's a clear absinthe that doesn't have that secondary infusion of herbs. So what you have to do is shoot for as much complexity in your product just through the distillate as you possibly can. I've distilled mushrooms, Christmas tree, celery seeds, mangoes, something that smells good, something that tastes good. You want to see how much of that you can capture. There's an opportunity to be truly manipulative towards people uh, in a good way. Here in the East Bay, we've got some great parks in the hills. They have very distinct aromas. Part of those aromas uh, is a signature of some of the cedar trees that are there, the eucalyptus that's there. To take all those ingredients and blend them together into a regional park gin. To, to drink a martini that as soon as you pick it up and you smell it, you're transported to a park. It's, it's a great feeling and I'd love to be able to start taking advantage of that opportunity. You see the color of that. The only place you should see that color is either in a bridesmaid dress or on The Simpsons when they're showing reactor coolant. It's a bullshit color. It's totally fake. Initially, when we first do the infusion, this is this beautiful, deep emerald green. Over time, it starts to change and it becomes more of a dead leaf green. It's real and it's beautiful because of that. It's, it's really important when you're looking at an absinthe to find one that's got a color that's an honest color because in all likelihood, if they're going to be honest about the color, they're going to be honest about everything else that they're putting in it.